All right, welcome to the Jeju Forum 2021. My name is Carol Giacomo and I'm the chief editor of Arms Control Today. Previously, I was with the New York Times editorial board for 13 years as the senior writer on foreign policy and defense um, uh, subjects. Uh, for purposes of this forum, I took a trip to North Korea in 2017 uh, as part of my job with the editorial board. Today's session has been organized by the Jeju Peace Institute, the Wilson Center, and the Brussels School of Governance as part of the Jeju Forum. Our topic, as you probably know, is reconsidering arms control with North Korea. In recent modern history, there's never been a lack of compelling issues dealing with North Korea. In, the country conducted its first nuclear test in 2006, but I wrote my first story about North Korea in 1992 when Arnold Cantor was Under Secretary of State for the United States and, he held the, the, and the United States held the highest level meeting with North Korea since the Korean War. Today, we have a new US president, a new US policy review, and an expanding North Korea nuclear capability to add further dimension to our discussion. And so we have assembled a distinguished panel of experts from around the world to do just that. Dr. Gina Kim is a research fellow at the Korea Institute for Defense Analyses, specializing in US-Korea, North Korea relations, nuclear nonproliferation, and Northeast Asian security in general. She is the author of the North Korean Nuclear Weapons Crisis, published in 2014. Vipin Narang is an associate professor of political science at MIT and a member of MIT's security studies program. His first book, Nuclear Strategy in the Modern Era, published in 2014, focuses on the deterrent strategies of regional nuclear powers. His second book, Strategies of Nuclear Proliferation, explores how states pursue nuclear weapons. Dr. Ramon Pacheco Pardo is an associate professor in international relations at King's College London and the KFVUW Korea Chair at the Brussels School of Governance. He is also King's Regional Envoy for East and Southeast Asia, helping to shape and implement the university's strategy for the region. Jean Lee is a veteran journalist who opened the AP News Agency's Pyongyang Bureau in 2012 and spent many years reporting from North Korea. She's now co-host of the BBC's Lazarus Heist podcast about North Korean cyber and is affiliated with the Wilson Center in Washington, DC. For today's session, we're going to start with opening remarks from each of our panelists and then move on to a moderated discussion. If you, have, if, if you in the audience have questions, please tweet them to us at, at Korea underscore center or at Korea chair underscore EU. And we'll start with Dr. Gina Kim. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, this uh, panel. Um, in my opinion, um, the two Koreas have uh, discussed conventional arms control for a long time. And uh, during the last three decades, since early 1990s, uh, we had at least 10 major uh, military CBM agreements, but we could not fully implement those agreement indeed because of contention over denuclearization, which deepened animosity between the two Koreas, which then complicated cooperation on military uh, confidence building measures. So it is really hard to imagine that South Koreans support arms control without a clear end state, which is denuclearization. I'm not sure whether Nerd Korea will be totally satisfied with an arms control agreement. Nuclear arms control cannot provide um, the level of security that Nerd Korea wants. As long as it has nuclear weapons, um, non-aggression pact, for example, which Nerd Korea always emphasizes, is not a viable option to be offered. This means a prolonged, unstable um, status quo situation for the leadership in Pyongyang. 
in the USDPRK negotiations for 30 years, security guarantee has been more important than economy issues. So security anxiety in North Korea will continue and security concerns in South Korea and the US cannot be uh, resolved either. There are, um, in my mind, two ways to solve this problem, either giving North Korea an absolute security guarantee or um, dramatically changing rock US allied posture to keep military balance than North Korea desires. Um, North Korea faced disarmament proposal in July 1987 uh, actually included the withdrawal of U.S. troops, the removal of military bases, the ban on nuclear weapons deployment, and the establishment of peace zone in this region. Um, however, for decades, the U.S. government has maintained its position that Negotiation with North Korea will have no effect on the preparedness of U.S. troops in South Korea. So I wonder if um, the distance can change over time. And I'm not sure if the U.S. Congress, for example, uh, supports this idea. The role of Congress is very crucial in my mind. Uh, historically, budget restrictions hampered the delivery of what was offered previously to North Korea by the U.S. government. I expect that any interim measure can include some form of incentives for the North Korean regime. And if the U.S. government uh, cannot provide corresponding measures in exchange of um, arms control of any kind, an agreement will not be sustainable. Um, here's what we expect in an arms control situation, uh, first, North Korea's nuclear material remains, uh, North Korea's compliance with the moratorium on freezing its nuclear activities is continuously verified, and the declaration of non-use of nuclear weapons uh, will follow, and the possibility of denuclearization negotiation is still open, right? Nonetheless, problems that may arise during the arms control process uh, are the following. First, um, stability instability paradox. Under the nuclear shadow, if you will, North Korea may be emboldened to engage in a crisis at a low level to coerce South Korea to seek a political settlement that it prefers. There's that kind, uh, one possibility. And North Korea will assume that South Korea prefers de-escalation and termination of a crisis as quickly as possible. If North Korea engages in a local provocation, then it becomes the wrong military that is in charge of military operations. It is not in South Korea's interest to escalate the situation to possible nuclear exchange and North Korea can continue to utilize South Korea's positions in a crisis. Second, there is also a possibility that uh, South Korea's military strategy will be more offensive than before when we remain at an interim stage of nuclear arms control. So the military is supposed to uh, prepare for the worst case scenario. So in dealing with a nuclear armed North Korea, well, the ROG military's first priority will be neutralizing strategic targets such as uh, ballistic missile operational area before launch. So if a confrontation is about to escalate, then South Korean military will aim at making a very quick decision to detect and destroy strategic targets in order to minimize damages to be done. Right. So preemptive military action plan can be more openly discussed within South Korea. Third, arms race in other areas can happen, in my mind. If denuclearization remains as the ultimate goal, North Korea will have interest in developing conventional weapons with asymmetry capabilities in the expectation that North Korea has to prepare for a possible change in the balance of power on the Korean Peninsula after denuclearization. This will disincentivize the leadership in Pyongyang to work uh, seriously on conventional arms control. Not only North Korea, but also South Korea can engage in developing um, 
so-called below threshold assets, ISR, early warning system, and strike capabilities, and, and missile defense, etc. This further uh, complicates military confidence building measures between the two Koreas. Um, fourth, I'm concerned that the South Korean public will become more conservative <laughs> than before under any government. Conservative voice cannot be dismissed. People will talk about nuclear armament or redeployment of tactical nuclear weapons to increase credibility of extended deterrence more actively than before. And the idea is that, well, South Korea should establish a new equilibrium on the Korean Peninsula to effectively prevent North Korea from making miscalculation about the credibility of deterrence by the allied forces. Um, lastly, um, even with arms control agreement, verification should be guaranteed. It will not be easy, by the way, to reach an agreement with uh, North Korea. Well, especially over the scope and the level of verification. Like it did in the past, North Korea may try to argue that only declared facilities uh, shall be subject to verification. Um, for example, in November 2007, after agreeing on the second phase actions for the implementation of the joint statement by the six-party talk, North Korea at the time argued that only sites of visit and interviews can be part of verification. We had a uh, you know, very difficult uh, uh, situation at the time. Plus, North Korea in the past demanded economic incentives such as energy assistance as a precondition to cooperate in verification. It also asked mutual inspection on both sides, the North and the South, demanding that especially the U.S. should open up USFK bases in, in, in South Korea. So all things can come up again when we talk about verification of arms control uh, mechanism. So um, these are the issues that I have in mind, and I look forward to uh, further discussions. Thank you. Gina, you set a really good basis for our discussion today. Uh, Vipin, do you want to uh, add your comments and perhaps react a little bit to what uh, Dr. Kim had to say? Sure. Thank you, Carol. Um, and thank you to the Jeju Forum uh, for having me. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, uh, and hopefully we can do it uh, in person soon in the future. Uh, what I thought I would do is um, sort of give a 30,000 foot overview of where we are with North Korea uh, in the nuclear program right now and sort of a pathway forward uh, to address uh, some of the uh, outstanding issues uh, on, on uh, nuclear and ballistic missiles. So uh, I'll start with sort of some bedrock assumptions that I have when I approach uh, the North Korean nuclear problem. And this is sort of based on, uh, you know, other nuclear powers and how they've approached nuclear weapons uh, and sort of, you know, what options then are available uh, going forward with North Korea. So the first core assumption is that Kim Jong-un is not going to unilaterally and voluntarily surrender his nuclear weapons. We've historically never had a state other than South Africa relinquish an independent nuclear weapons capability that it had not inherited from the former Soviet Union. And the conditions that led South Africa and the de Klerk government to give up its six and a half nuclear weapons without any ballistic missiles are very different, obviously, than North Korea's, which it believes faces an existential threat uh, from the United States uh, and South Korea. And North Korea's force far exceeds anything South Africa ever had. We've never otherwise had a case where a state has voluntarily relinquished its nuclear weapons because they are, at the end of the day, uh, a state's insurance policy against existential threats. Uh, and since South Africa did uh, surrender its nuclear weapons, Kim Jong-un can point to the uh, Iraqi case and the Libyan case where you don't fight the new, you, you don't even pretend you're, you're going to fight the United States unless you have nuclear weapons, which I think has been the lesson of the post-Cold War era for many states. So that's number one. Number two is eliminating North Korea's nuclear force and ballistic missile capabilities through military force or a counterforce strike, whether conventional or nuclear, risks nuclear use against South Korea, Japan, or the United States. 
So it is simply infeasible at this point to take away his nuclear weapons and ballistic missile capability by external force without risking nuclear use in the process. We know that when the Obama administration did this study about you know, uh, a, a US uh, conventional counterforce strike against North Korea, the estimate was that the United States would be able to get 80% of the known capabilities. First of all, North Korea's nuclear force has grown since then. Second of all, Kim Jong-un has likely taken uh, deception, camouflage, and amb ambiguity to his benefit to increase the uncertainty about how many nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles he may possess and where they might be in real time. So you would miss 20% of the known capabilities, and then you would have the unknown capabilities remaining. And all of those could potentially be used against South Korean targets, Japanese targets, American targets, uh, or anything Kim Jong-un might be able to hit. So taking them away by force uh, is uh, too costly and too risky. The third assumption is that a constrained North Korean nuclear force and missile force is preferable to an unconstrained nuclear and missile force. It is better for the world, and I would argue for North Korea, to have limits on the sweet portfolio diversity and number of nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles that North Korea possesses. It is easier for North Korea to manage. It is less risky, you know, that there may be an accidental or inadvertent use. And it is better for the region and for the United States to constrain the size and the improvements in North Korea's nuclear and missile force. It is also important to constrain the force so that North Korea isn't tempted or able to proliferate to other actors such as Syria, uh, which we know North Korea had cooperated with in the past. The fourth assumption then is that Kim Jong-un and North Korea, given the economic situation, the food situation, potentially the COVID situation right now, may want some real sanctions relief from the United States and its partners. Even if Russia and China have taken a lot of the air out of the maximum pressure campaign, there are still benefits to North Korea, I would argue, to having sanctions removed from the United States and the West. That means there is a deal to be had. North Korea is going, not going to voluntarily give up its nuclear weapons. We can't take them away. But it is better for both North Korea, the region, and the world to control the size and the improvements in the missile and nuclear force and there might be an opportunity now, especially, to approach North Korea about some sort of sanctions relief in exchange for slowing the growth of the program, then talking about capping the program, maybe even limited rollbacks of certain capabilities that North Korea may not need or want anymore, old liquid fuel missiles, for example, all of which make North Korea and the region more secure. So I think we're at sort of an opportune moment to think about what I call a large, uh, the broader family of risk reduction measures, of which arms control is one arm. So risk reduction, in my view, has two components. One is controlling the capabilities that North Korea might have, reducing the risk of inadvertent, advertent, or accidental nuclear use. And the other is reducing the intention or incentive that Kim Jong-un may have to use the capabilities that he has. So there is a willingness and a capability piece to risk, risk reduction. So what did the Trump administration do after the 2017 sprint where North Korea became an undisputed nuclear weapons power with an ICBM capability? The fault in the Trump administration approach, I would argue, was that it focused entirely on the willingness side of the equation and risk reduction. It was easier and cheaper for President Trump to write love letters to Kim Jong-un hoping that Kim Jong-un wouldn't use the nuclear capabilities he had, but there was very little attention paid to a realistic arms control piece that married with sort of the love letters that he would send Kim. And that bill came due at Hanoi, I would argue, that the discrepancy between the rhetoric and the Trump administration's approach to the North Korean nuclear capabilities was too large to paper over at Hanoi in the sense that Kim Jong-un uh, 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 arrived in Hanoi expecting that he would get a something for something deal with President Trump after all of the love letters. After all, President Trump said he didn't care as long as North Korea didn't test nuclear weapons or ICBMs. 
But then when the Trump administration arrived in Hanoi, John Bolton's memoir suggests that they asked for everything, including b- chemical, biological weapons, undeclared uranium enrichment facilities, all ballistic missiles. And although there were some in the Trump administration who supported a more calibrated and piecemeal approach in tandem, Steve Began in particular, the Hanoi meeting seems to have imploded because of this wide discrepancy between what Kim Jong-un expected from President Trump in terms of capabilities, a more uh, sort of step-by-step process, then met with the demand that Kim Jong-un surrender everything, the whole enchilada plus the guacamole and the, the sour cream on the side. And so the, the, the emphasis simply on the love letters and trying to reduce the chance that Kim Jong-un used a nuclear weapon against the United States and its partners backfired tremendously in Hanoi because it was it was too hard to paper over then the difference in the capability approach and the intention approach. But now with the Biden administration's review, what little bit has been leaked to the public, I think uh, gives me some optimism that as a sustainable long-term approach, there is harmony between sort of the intention piece and the capability piece. The Biden administration seems to realistically believe that Kim Jong-un is not going to give up his nuclear weapons capability, but there is a potential deal to be had through a series of confidence-building measures that, as my friend John Delury put it, is a something-for-something deal. North Korea gives something. The United States gives something on sanctions relief. There's verification and a confidence-building process that enhances trust between the two. I'm not, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm realistic enough to argue that there'll never be you know, trust between the United States and North Korea, but at least a process that gives both sides confidence that they're adhering to sort of a broad risk reduction approach. And the process of negotiating a, a, a slow a slowdown in the growth of the program, caps on certain capabilities like the ICBM uh, missiles, uh, maybe eliminating a certain class of liquid fuel, medium range ballistic missiles, all reinforces in a positive feedback loop the confidence that the two can work together and that North Korea will get something in return for giving up something. And there will be verification and there will be uh, contact between the two in a way that sustains a broad risk reduction approach. And there's uh, a, a, a reduction in the intention and the incentive of North Korea to use its capabilities at the same time constraining the capabilities that it has that it can use that pose a threat to the region uh, and the world. So going forward, it appears as if the, the this is a sustainable approach, and I'm optimistic that it is a long-term solution uh, to the North Korea nuclear problem with the caveat that we may keep denuclearization as the end point. As Colin Call just said at the Carnegie Nuclear Conference, denuclearization is a long journey. And we'll keep it as a rhetorical endpoint because, and this is important, the United States cannot de jure accept North Korea as a nuclear weapons power. It is outside the NPT. It cheated on the NPT, withdrew. The United States is simultaneously uh, you know, trying to get back into the JCPOA with an Iran that it says cannot be a nuclear weapons power. But it would be de facto acceptance of North Korea as a nuclear weapons power, which may be sufficient for North Korea. And it may allow the United States to continue with uh, its non-proliferation policies going forward. Now, the United States, the problem, the reason why the United States spent a quarter century trying to stop nu- in North Korea from getting nuclear weapons is because it puts the United States and its partners in a very difficult position now because North Korea is a nuclear weapons power. That is a reality. It's not going to give them up. You can't take them away. You can't de jure accept it, but you have to live with it. And so uh, an arms control or risk reduction approach recognizes that you have to coexist with a nuclear North Korea. You may not like it, And you can keep denuclearization as a rhetorical endpoint, the long journey, while uh, achieving meaningful objectives and uh, uh, and waypoints along the way that constrain North Korea's nuclear and missile force uh, and uh, reduce the incentive that Kim Jong-un might use them. Now, the problem, and I'll stop here right now, is that while North Korea and the United States may agree, agree broadly on this substantive something for something approach. There is one problem that that 
uh, may make it difficult to get the whole process jump started, and that is the sequencing problem. Who goes first? And I think this latest round of uh, statements from North Korea, Kim Yo Jong, just the other day, uh, saying they have no interest in talking to the United States, and the United States hoping that North Korea will come to the table, I think highlights the sequencing problem in the sense that North Korea believes that the ball is in the United States court right now, that the U.S. has to go first with giving up some sanctions relief because it believes that it has not tested ICBMs and it hasn't conducted a nuclear test. So it's lived up to its sort of very low bar of quote unquote denuclearization steps from the Trump administration. Whereas the United States still believes that those that's cheap talk and North Korea's missile and nuclear force is still improving. All of the KN-23 tests continue to improve North Korea's short range ballistic missile force, which will find their way, I believe, into the long range force. And so the Biden administration may believe actually North Korea still has to do something first. And this issue of who goes first may make it difficult to jumpstart the process. But if one side is willing to bite the bullet, even rhetorically, to get the other side to the table, there is a deal to be had and a process that is sustainable in which the Trump, you know, the Trump administration's approach was not sustainable because there was no there was no uh, alignment between rhetoric and reality on sort of intention and capabilities. Whereas I think the Biden administration approach has uh, a more realistic approach. And if it gets jump started, I'm confident that we can have a broad risk reduction sort of strategy with North Korea. So I'll stop there uh, and look forward to questions. Thanks, Carol. Sure. Uh, so so we have a little bit of optimism there. Uh, we're going to go now to Dr. Pacheco Pardo uh, for his comments, and uh, I would be interested personally in, in whether he thinks that what Bipin has been saying is realistic or not. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I have to, to start by saying that I do think uh, it is realistic <laughs> what both uh, Bipin and China have, have been uh, uh, talking about, especially Bipin, he has been very optimistic, as he normally is, actually. Uh, and, and, I, and I have to, I'm going to add only a, a couple of points related to this process of, of potentially reaching a nuclear arms control with North Korea and, and that relates to uh, what doors uh, this would open beyond the, the nuclear issue because the panel today focuses on the nuclear issue, but we all know that it's not the only issue that uh, we have to discuss when it comes to, to, to North Korea. Uh, and I think there are two uh, potential advantages uh, beyond obviously uh, arms control over North Korea and, and potentially change the relationship between the US and, and, and Pyongyang from a, a nuclear deal. Uh, the, the first one of which is uh, what happens between the two Koreas. And I think, uh, I mean, China mentioned it and, and I agree with her, S South Korea cannot accept a nuclear, uh, North Korea. The end goal has to be denuclearization, however realistic this might or might not be. But in any case, an arms control deal with start to hopefully fundamentally transform the relationship between the between the two Koreas. We would be uh, in an environment in which there would be confidence building measures, uh, in which North Korea would be uh, taking steps towards nuclearization, or at the very least there would be uh, less provocations uh, than they have been in the in, 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 in the past. And this should open the door uh, eventually, as uh, Bipin was saying, to, to potentially sanctions relief at some point. Uh, and, and this would lead to more inter-Korean uh, economic cooperation to begin with, more inter-Korean uh, exchanges. Now, uh, I see this as hugely uh, beneficial, clearly, for uh, peace in the Korean Peninsula, for inter-Korean reconciliation. I think reunification is a question for another day, not, not, not at this uh, point in time, clearly. So, so I think there would be a, a transformation in the Korean Peninsula that would be beneficial for, for both Koreas and especially uh, I think for North Koreans, not North Korea the regime, but North Koreans, uh, their population. Uh, I think it was yesterday that there were these trade statistics between uh, North Korea and the rest of the world and South Korea and the rest of the world uh, last month. And, and, and you could see in the statistics that what South Korea exports in one minute is what North Korea exports in the whole month, right? So the huge economic differential uh, between both of them uh, if there is an arms control deal that allows for our discussions to be had, including about inter-Korean peace, inter-Korean reconciliation, economic exchanges, would clearly benefit the North Korean uh, uh, population, 
uh, however uh, unpalatable we might find the, the, the regime, uh, clearly part of the uh, economic bonanza that potentially North Korea could have from arms control deal would reach the, the population uh, of the country. So I think this is something that we, we should consider as well. And I'm, 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 I'm sure we all know the South Korean government and the current administration, the Moon uh, administration has been pushing for inter-Korean economic cooperation. Of course, we have elections uh, next year, but, but I think it would be unlikely uh, that any South Korean government, regardless of whether it's liberal or conservative, would want to go back to, to what we saw, for example, in, in, in 2010, when we have the Yongpyeong shelling, for example, the Chonan sinking. So we have this uh, inter-Korean enmity. So I think that South Korea will keep pushing for some sort of engagement uh, with North Korea, regardless of who wins the, the election uh, next year. And uh, I think with an arms control deal, potentially we could see this inter-Korean exchange is beneficial for both of them, but I said, especially for North Korea. Uh, and there's a second aspect as well, uh, which is uh, obviously one of the reasons why the international community, including the US, South Korea, of course, but including Europe as well and the European Union, one of the reasons why they are very wary uh, of the North Korean nuclear weapons program is uh, the potential for proliferation and the potential for other countries replicating the North Korean model, saying, well, uh, North Korea has developed a nuclear weapons program, uh, and, and, and look, uh, it has been able to to, to extract uh, concessions. I think if we had an arms control deal whereby North Korea would start to take steps towards dismantling parts of the nuclear weapons program, in which potentially there would be inspectors uh, in, in inside North Korea, as we have seen in the past, of course, this wouldn't be nothing new, it would be a return to, to what we had uh, uh, historically. Inside, inside North Korea, uh, I, I think this could lead other countries to realize that the potential benefits of having a nuclear weapons program are not uh, necessarily there. That North Korea is accruing more benefits from an arms control deal, from raining on its nuclear program, from uh, starting to dismantle the nuclear uh, weapons program, that, than from actually building the program that has led to a very comprehensive sanctions regime that has led to economic isolation really from the international community with the exception of China uh, and partially Russia. Uh, so, so in a sense, uh, obviously in security terms, North Korea has gained significantly from the nuclear weapons program and the example of uh, Iraq was mentioned before by my, my, my fellow panelists. But when it comes to economic well-being, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, diplomatic relations with other countries, the nuclear weapons program clearly has constrained uh, the choices for North Korea in terms of its relations with uh, with the outside world. And, and, and uh, we know that North Korea already going back to the 1970s, one of its foreign policy goals was to normalize diplomatic relations with the United States. And he hasn't been able to achieve this and is very far away from reaching this because of the nuclear weapons program. So, so potentially the US could offer liaison offices uh, to begin with, who knows, if, who knows if embassies in the future uh, as a goodwill gesture, as a concession, however way you want to, to put it. And uh, I think with an arms control deal, if we open the opportunity for North Korea's economy to become more integrated in the world economy, to become more integrated in international diplomatic networks, who knows, maybe international institutions as well than it currently is, uh, other countries could see the advantages of uh, not pursuing a nuclear weapons program and actually um, uh, uh, moving in, 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 in the opposite direction to try to have better relations with the outside uh, world. Uh, there's one last point, a uh, minor point maybe that I wanted uh, uh, to add as well, but I think is, 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 is important. And I think my fellow panelists uh, mentioned it, right? The fact that uh, with the exception of South Africa, no country has given up its nuclear weapons program. I think is if you ask um, 100 North Korea experts, 99.9% .9 will say North Korea is not going to join South Africa and giving up its nuclear uh, weapons, weapons program. So if we make this a starting point, we have to go to the realistic option. And I think the realistic option is an arms control uh, deal. And I do agree uh, with the point that the Biden administration seems to understand uh, this. Uh, I don't know about previous administration if they understood it or not, but at least in public, they wanted denuclearization. Now some, uh, the current administration is talking about potential arms control deal uh, as a starting point. So I think that's the last point I wanted to make, that we also have to be realistic about what we can achieve. Uh, and right now, what we can achieve is really uh, an arms control deal. I will leave it there for my initial remarks. Uh, thanks, Carol, and I look forward for the, to the Q&A. Terrific. Thanks so much, Ramon. Uh, we're going to bring Jean into the discussion now. Thank you, Carol. 
And just hearing from all of you reminds me how much I wish we could be with Gina in Jeju. Although, thank you, Gina, for joining us from your hotel room. It's quite late in South Korea right now. Uh, but you all laid out these points so well. And unfortunately, I hate to say that I, I won't provide a contrarian position because I, I agree with everything that's been said so far. I did want to uh, remind everybody that today does mark the start of the, the anniversary of the start of the Korean War. Uh, I just, I, I get, got an alert on my, in my calendar, which I always set for both June 25th and July 27th. Uh, July 27th is, of course, the bigger, uh, the day that the North Koreans recognize as Victory Day. Um, but I wanted to mention this because I was so struck by the awarding of the Medal of Honor to a Korean War veteran, an American Korean War veteran, during the recent Biden Moon Summit in Washington, here in Washington, D.C., because I think it really served as a reminder of the shared history and the the shared history and the shared future between South Korea and the United States. It was such a remarkable show of living history, but also a reminder, I think, that Americans need, and perhaps even young South Koreans, that the Korean War hasn't been resolved. And so to see that, uh, that event broadcast on national TV in the United States, this is a war that we call the Forgotten War. Uh, and so it was a reminder to Americans, remember why we are doing all of this. It was just a, such an interesting way to recognize and remind the American audience of the relationship uh, between South Korea and the United States. And the reason the adversaries, the Korean War adversaries, uh, the reason why that relationship, how it started, why it's so important, why it's so relevant today. Um, there are so many other things about that summit that I think are interesting, primarily how it showcased South Korea's development and how inspirational I think that will be. But in one sense, it did remind us that, that we still have this threat uh, as, as allies and, and in the region. And that I think is in stark contrast to the daily reminders that you have in North Korea of the threat from the United States. And these are embedded into, into daily life. And I think that as many of you know, and some of us here have spent time in North Korea, including Carol, um, it can feel like you're in an alternate reality in so many different ways. And chief among them, I think, is this narrative that the nation is under imminent attack from outside forces. And I spent a lot of time reading North Korean textbooks and, and spending time in North Korean schools, uh, hearing what the students are told. And this thread runs through their education, starting with China, moving on to Japan, and now primarily these perceived threats from the United States. And so it's as Vipin mentioned, the regime keeps the people in a constant state of existential crisis. Uh, and these ballistic missiles and nuclear weapons are portrayed as a protector, right? The, the treasured source. And I would say it's not just about self-defense and security, but that is the narrative that the North Koreans project. It's also about uh, regime security, uh, as Gina, as Dr. Kim mentioned, uh, boosting the Kim family's legitimacy as the saviors and protect, protectors of their people. So I agree with all of you that, um, you know, with this narrative, the regime is really, there's one other thing, they're really, what you see on the ground is that they're, they're, they're seeking to instill pride in the North Korean people in, in their ability to build and test these weapons successfully on their own. You see these images of long range rockets, they're woven into everyday life. You see rockets on the playground. So kids are crawling all over these rockets. They're on the new notebooks that the kids use at school, on, on the calendars that were in my hotel room. Um, and of course, on the posters and the, the stamps, the flower displays, everything that we see as well. And so much of this is, is portrayed as space exploration, um, but it's also clear on the ground in North Korea that this is about weapons. And I would, I mentioned the space exploration because this issue of holding on to their, their rockets and their missiles is also about sovereignty. Um, North Korea's belief that they have the right to do what other countries can do, and that's to use rockets to explore space. Uh, and now with the agreement at, announced at the Biden Moon Summit, South Korea also has that right to, to uh, extend its ability to explore uh, space with, by sending, they now have the lifting of the restrictions on missiles. Uh, so that will be a point I think that North Korea will raise. 
I just think that nuclear weapons are so central to the Kim family rule that it's hard to see why, as all of you say, Kim Jong-un would entirely give them up. Um, and and Vipin, I like that you mentioned the whole enchilada. I am just imagining North Korean diplomats watching this session and taking notes and writing down enchilada and having to try to figure out what that is. Because though I saw burritos in North Korea, they didn't call it that. And I definitely never had an enchilada in Pyongyang. Uh, but they're not going to give up the whole enchilada. But I suspect they might give up the, you know, maybe the guacamole, maybe the sour cream. I mean, for me, the sour cream is the first thing to go. Uh, so maybe some parts of the program. Uh, and I do think I've always maintained throughout all of these tensions that followed the breakdown of the talks in, in Hanoi, that I do believe that Kim Jong-un does want to come back to the negotiating table. He wants to come back, however, in a stronger position. Uh, and if we are, and I do think it's a much more reasonable and realistic approach uh, to consider uh, consider the reality of North Korea and Kim Jong-un's willingness to give up the nuclear weapons and just think about arms control, uh, but what the question I have, and I hope we can discuss this, is are we prepared for the consequences? Are we prepared to accept North Korea as a de facto nuclear power? How does that, where does that leave South Korea? Uh, Dr. Kim mentioned, Gina, you mentioned this as the nuclear shadow. Um, I think these are really important questions. Uh, will, this, will this lead to an enhanced arms race in Northeast Asia? And instead of moving us toward uh, a reduction of arms buildup? Um, these are questions I'm hoping that we can discuss, or discuss. but I also wanted to, you mentioned, uh, I think Vipin, you mentioned ambiguity. Uh, and I think that one of our biggest challenges right now is we're all, we all are in agreement to a certain degree that arms control or risk reduction is the right approach. But how do we get North Korea to the table? And one of our biggest challenges now is our lack of access to the North Koreans, and I would say this is by design, by the North Koreans, they see access or more specifically the withholding of access as leverage. We see them use this effectively, consistently with the South Koreans. We see this in the uh, the rebuffing statement from Kim Yo-jong, Kim Jong-un's sister, in trying to give the cold shoulder to the signals that they're seeing from the United States. I think the, the Biden administration's approach has been right in staying calm and taking all of these uh, responses in stride and seeing that as part of the diplomatic dance that is really starting to happen now. And instead of overreacting to, and in some ways this, I do see this as, it's not strategic patience 2.0 because it is still very open to engagement. But it is a, a tactic or an approach of remaining calm and, and taking things in stride, which I think this administration understands is part of the preparation for eventual uh, diplomacy. Uh, I think, though, so that we have to acknowledge, and, and um, Dr. Pacheco Pardo mentioned this, the, the reality of the situation on the ground in North Korea. Uh, and I, I mentioned this because we also want to discuss the stakes. What are what are the stakes? And I think for North Korea, with the border closure, it's been they, this border has been sealed since January 2020. That has had a no doubt a huge impact on the daily lives of North Koreans. Uh, I can't even I mean even in the best of times when I was there at the height of openness, things were very very difficult. When you get past the uh, capital, it is, and even inside the capital, away from the, the glossy downtown areas, it is very difficult. And so I cannot imagine what it's like now for the people of North Korea, uh, and we don't have enough people on the ground to tell us. And that, again, I think is this ambiguity, the lack of access that the North Koreans are trying to impose to prevent us from seeing what's happening. And also, I would say, to prevent their own people from uh, information that could uh, lead to some destabilization among the people. And so this is something that we have to be very concerned about. I think that the given uh, how difficult the situation it has been in North Korea, the stakes are going to be even greater, as um, Dr. Narang mentioned, when we do get to the table with the North Koreans. Uh, and so that has to be, not only are the stakes higher for the North Koreans, but we're going to be contending with an enhanced program, right? Because they're continuing the development 
of their weapons, even if we don't see it. And so that all, all of that has to be taken into consideration. Uh, I am, as 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 Carol, as you mentioned, I'm co-hosting this podcast, uh, uh, the Lazarus Heist on cyber, because I've been very interested in trying to understand how North Korea is getting the funds that it needs to maintain the strategic position when the borders are closed, when sanctions are imposed. And I see cyber as one of the main sources of income that is going, perhaps being missed or going undetected because it's so hard for us to wrap our heads around. Uh, so I'm going to leave it there. I'm not providing, I think that our speakers have provided such great uh, examples. I think the sequencing question is 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 a big one. What will be required, I think, in, uh, to get these negotiations back on track, what uh, concessions will be required, and what are the consequences of any concession that is made, um, both for the North Koreans and for uh, the United States and other countries as well. How do you build confidence? And I agree completely, and I, I always say this, that we don't need to have we can we can hold on to our lack of trust, uh, but we just need to we don't need to give them everything that they are asking for. We just need to be on, in a process where we understand that there's mutual respect. And I agree that the current approach that we're seeing so far is one that appears to have potential to be sustainable. And I think that that idea of sustainable principled engagement is going to be very important if we want. And if we want to see North Korea come out of its isolation, and if we want North Korea and the North Korean people to thrive. So I, and I apologize, I'm, I'm having a little difficulty speaking, so um, I will hand it back over to Carol. Thank you so much. Thanks an awful lot, Jean. You, you added a lot to the discussion. Um, we're going to have a few questions now. Um, hopefully we'll get in as much discussion as possible. So the if the panelists could answer answer the questions as succinctly as they can, uh, it will allow us to sort of get to more topics. Dr. Kim, I, I would ask you, at this moment, um, what's South Korea's contribution to uh, to negotiations, to the diplomatic, uh, you know, environment? Uh, now that, and I'll put one specific out there, now that the Biden administration has agreed to uh, just do away with the missile limits, um, does this mean that it's better for Seoul to just uh, accelerate its missile production? Um, does, does it use that as a, um, or does it not leap forward with missile production and hold that as a bargaining chip of some kind. Anyway, what, what's, what's South Korea's next move? All right, uh, first on the sole defense guideline, uh, it's gone because realistically uh, speaking, there was no uh, true uh, restriction on South Korea's capability uh, to develop a missile engine. Uh, the R&D could continue, and there was a trade-off between the payload and the range of the missile. So uh, we can, uh, with a lighter warhead on, on the missile that we develop, we could actually uh, have a longer range. So um, the that was the cal the, that was the, the the recent change was the reflection of the current situation on the ground. But we uh, intentionally mentioned last time that there will be a cap on the range of the missile development, which was 800 kilometers, because 800 kilometers is the distance between uh, Jeju Island, where I am, and Shinichu, northern part of North Korea. That means we are not developing a missile that can strike against Chinese territory. Because of consider strategic considerations, we did not want to offend China. So that consideration will not change. So it'll be very, very difficult to imagine that South Korea will come out and say that we're going to target China by extending the range of the missile. So it'll take time and the, the calculation is going to be very, very um, complex in nature. And what South Korea can do, first of all, um, well, um, I think 
it is possible that if a narrator com- comes back to the negotiation table, that we can continue to talk about linking um, peace regime on the Korean Peninsula and denuclearization. And the first idea that we can offer on the table is perhaps uh, talking about a new uh, basic agreement between the two Koreas, because the the previous agreement uh, that we had was in, to, uh, in 1991, which was a very old one. So we have to uh, reconsider a new type of relationship based upon uh, economic and and social and other types of cooperation and exchange. That can be the first thing that we can consider. However, in my opinion, peace treaty, uh, we have to think about it uh, in a a step-by-step way. We can talk about the peace treaty, but it can uh, it can replace the existing armies treaty, which can uh, be a, a basis, legal basis to maintain UNC UN command on the Korean Peninsula. If we suddenly replace the armies treaty without denuclearization, then the the basis of the UNC is gone, and we are going to have another round of talks on how to uh, deal with the USFK on the Korean Peninsula and other alliance related issues will come up again. So we can discuss peace treaty while. We are talking about denuclearization, but how to make it effective? We can. We have to decide the 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 timing when we actually sign the treaty. Although we can discuss what to be included, uh, what should be included in this document, because legally. Uh, signing a legally binding document is different from just a politically mentioning that we have no war on the Korean Peninsula. So we have to uh, have a serious thought on uh, the peace treaty. Another thing that South Korea can contribute to uh, this dialogue is, well, we can consider cooperative threat reduction because cooperative threat reduction um, has lots of activities. We are not just talking about eliminating North Korea's nuclear weapons or missile. We are talking about um, cleaning up the environment. We are talking about converting the uh, military facility for uh, peaceful use. And we are also talking about training and education of the personnel there who was was involved in uh, WMD program. And we are also talking about uh, proliferation prevention activities, etc. So this, this takes lots of time, lots of manpower and a lot of money. So South Korea can contribute to this idea of cooperative threat reduction along with other regional countries who are uh, interested in denuclearizing uh, North Korea. How about military exercises with the United States? Where do, where does that come in the equation? Well, um, people are saying that, well, in October, South Korea will have military exercises with the U.S. So then um, North Korea will react to it harshly. But, um, well, for example, uh, us, well, uh, Military exercise has been uh, a critical issue between the two Koreas when there is a talk on denuclearization. But I'm not sure uh, if we say that there will be no exercise at all, then South, then North Korea will suddenly uh, be happy and talk about denuclearization. We, we don't know about that. There is so much uncertainty there. And uh, August military exercise is uh, mostly computer-based military exercise. So nothing uh, v- will be visible on the ground. So uh, it's going to be very small scale uh, joint exercises. So there's nothing that North Korea can criticize uh, in, in August. But uh, South Korea has a dilemma because in the long run, South Korea needs uh, joint military exercises because we want to uh, make sure that transfer of APCON will be happening anytime soon. In order to do that, we need to certify South Korea's capability. We passed a uh, certification of IOC, but we have to uh, make sure that we have um, um, we have to go to the second step and the third step. Uh, full mission capability is the third step. And, and we have uh, lots of uh, uh, um, uh, check, uh, checklist and we have to confirm uh, through uh, joint, uh, taking you know, a 
conducting joint military exercises to finish all this process. That's the South Korea's uh, goal. So in order to uh, obtain this goal, we have to do some exercises uh, on a normal scale. And that actually will uh, invite some criticism from North Korea. So we have this kind of dilemma. Thank you. Uh, Vipin, uh, how would de facto acceptance of North Korea as a nuclear power compare to the de facto acceptance of other nuclear powers that aren't part of the NPT, like India, like Pakistan, right. like Israel? Uh, and and how, how would it affect the, uh, uh, the Iran nuclear deal? I mean, those are, those are good questions. And you remember, um, if you remember in 1998, when India and Pakistan tested nuclear weapons, um, and they had never signed or uh, ratified the NPT. Uh, the U.S. policy, the Clinton administration policy towards both India and Pakistan was cap, roll back, and eliminate. Uh, and we're 0 for 3 with both countries. Uh, and there was essentially a de facto acceptance, um, particularly of India, but in, you know also of Pakistan. India, obviously, with the um, Indo-U.S. nuclear deal, um, which uh, a lot of non-proliferation professionals oppose because uh, they argued it essentially rewarded India for acquiring nuclear weapons outside the NPT. So there are there is precedent for it. And I think North Korea would likely fall in the same category as Pakistan and not so much India and um, and Israel, which is coincidental also, also because of the cooperation between North Korea and Pakistan on nuclear and missile technology, um, where there's a sort of a grudging uh, tolerance and coexistence with uh, you know, a, a state that got out of the nuclear barn. Um, the, the concern with North Korea, and this is something that I think does pose a challenge going forward, is North Korea is the only country to have essentially withdrawn from the NPT and then acquired nuclear weapons, as opposed to having never signed it at all. And there is, there, there's a legitimate concern, you know, uh, going forward, any future proliferator is going to be a former member of the NPT by definition, unless South Sudan, I think, it, uh, pursues nuclear weapons. I think South Sudan is the only country uh, that isn't part of the NPT that doesn't ha- uh, doesn't yet have nuclear weapons. And so there's uh, there is there is a legitimate concern uh, about that. But you know, the reality is that the time to stop North Korea was over the last quarter century, and successive U.S. administrations failed to do that. And you're left with, you know, pretty bad choices then, which is why, you know, the U.S. effort on non- why the JCPOA, in my view, is so important. Eliminating Iran's incentive to act on its nuclear hedge so that you don't have to deal with this problem once they get out of the barn. What do you do uh, then, you know, is so important. Um, but with North Korea, we're just in the land of bad options. I mean, this is with North Korea, you're always in the land of bad options, but particularly now, that they have nuclear weapons, ICBM capabilities, an increasingly capable suite of short-range ballistic missiles, uh, SLBM programs. I mean, this can be a monster of a program. And it is better for the world for it to be constrained and lean rather than, uh, you know, sort of unconstrained in a monster of a program. Um, one small note, and I wanted to, uh, I didn't have a chance uh, to mention uh Complete, you know, uh, completely separately, uh, this issue of the the range restriction on South Korean missiles. Uh, it, on the one hand, you know, it, it, it's um, there is a reasonable concern that this could spark an arms race between North Korea and South Korean conventional missiles. On the other hand, it's a good bargaining chip to get North Korea back to the table. And I think you know, it's it's sort of the uh, you know, build it up to trade it away strategy is not completely. Um, you know, uh, irrational and uh, it's plausible that it it provides enough of incentive or a little incentive for North Korea to come to the table. And it's it's not uh, North Korea is 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 the master at building leverage. Well, South Korea and the United States can build leverage too. And this is a this is not necessarily a bad way to do it. So I have mixed feelings about it. I I understand. I take the point that it um, you know, the, lifting the range restriction can certainly trigger an arms race in a North Korea that is not interested in negotiations at all, you know, may end up just responding to that very negatively. On the other hand, um, it does it does give South Korea and the United States some leverage at, at the at the at the negotiating table. So um, it, it's not it's not all necessarily bad in, in my view. Do you think that's why Biden, the Biden administration made that decision? 
I won't speak for the Biden administration of those in it, but uh, it certainly crossed my mind. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's it's possible, but I don't have any evidence one way or another for it. It wouldn't it, it would be a smart move, in my view, if, the, if that's if that was some, some of the rationale behind. It. OK, thank you. Um, so, Dr. Pacheco Prado, um, h- how do you think the North Koreans would react to an effort at arms control versus, uh, you know, uh, denuclearization? I think they would uh, they would welcome it. I, I, I think that for North Korea, once it has been the nuclear deterrent, it has shown the U.S. and South Korea and the rest of the world that it can actually build it even under a, a sanctions uh, re- regime. The security of the regime should be uh, guaranteed because I think like we have been talking uh, in, in in this panel, it is not going to give up his uh, nuclear weapons program, and, and and you know, and when you talk to to North Korean officials, they are very clear about it. They list the the countries that uh, didn't have weapons of mass destruction or gave them up. Uh, Libya, for example, is an example they 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 they, they use sometimes, and uh, as reasons why they wouldn't give up their their own their, their own program. So, if we move to an arms control deal, uh, this would open up uh, many possibilities for North Korea uh, in terms of other foreign policy objectives. Uh, we have talked before, I think Tina was mentioning it, right, about the legitimacy uh, of the Kim regime. And clearly the nuclear weapons program gives legitimacy to the regime, but the regime would also like to have legitimacy uh, in any in many other ways, for example, through economic development. And when Kim Jong-un came to office, obviously he's built in line. He was making very clear that he wanted to develop the North Korean uh, economy. Uh, and frankly, there is no better place in the world to develop your economy than Northeast Asia. You're next to the second biggest economy in the world, the third biggest economy in the world, and the 10th biggest economy uh, in the world, right? China, Japan, and, and South Korea. Uh, we know there would be investment uh, going into North Korea. There is investment going from from, from, from China, there would be investment from South Korea, but even uh, in Japan, there are firms that are eyeing business opportunities in North Korea. So the opportunity to develop the economy is clearly there uh, for the uh, for, 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 for the Kim regime. And in terms of legitimacy, I think uh, at some point, this would be as important as the nuclear weapons program. Of course, we don't know what the North Koreans, North Koreans themselves uh, think, right? There is very little data, some anecdotal evidence about the, what they might think or not think about their uh, the, the regime. But I think we can all agree that uh, the legitimacy that uh, Kim Jong-un might have is nothing compared to the legitimacy that his grandfather, Kim Il-sung, the founder of the country, uh, would have had. And I think the nuclear weapons program plus economic development would be very helpful in this uh, respect. Uh, the other point that uh, I would find interesting to uh, to know more about, but again, we don't know enough about North Korea, is how sincere Kim Jong-un is when he says he wants to improve relations with South Korea. Uh, we saw a, a recent ter- interview by South Korean President Moon Jae-in. He, he said that he thinks that uh, Kim Jong-un is sincere when he says he wants to uh, change the situation of the people in his country, but also the situation in the Korean uh, Others who have attended the summits that took place between uh, the two Koreas in 2018, who had the opportunity to talk to uh, Kim Jong-un or, or some of the other uh, North Korean officials who were present at the meetings that have expressed something similar, that they think that uh, North Korea is uh, sincere. Now, if we see, if we accept this as a starting premise, that North Korea wants to have better relations with South Korea, an arms control deal obviously would open the opportunity uh, for, for this to happen. And we're not only talking here about uh, inter-Korean economic relations, we're also talking potentially about uh, better political relations, more people uh, to people uh, uh, exchanges. Uh, and there's one last point, which I think going back to, to 2018, 2019 in this case, uh, I think we could see how Kim Jong-un was craving recognition by the international community. Uh, we didn't only have the summits with the U.S. and South Korea. There were summits with uh, with Russia. There were summits with um, uh, with China. Obviously, uh, there were state visits uh, to Vietnam uh, and to Singapore uh, as well. Uh, and before and after the summits with with with, with Trump in in Singapore and, and and Hanoi. So so I think we can see a leader who actually wants to be seen as a more 
who wants his country to be seen as a more normal country that can have good diplomatic relations and good political relations uh, with several countries across the world and in the immediate neighborhood, right? Northeast Asia, but also Southeast Asia, if we can include in the neighborhood of, of, of North Korea. So, so I think there will be all these uh, uh, advantages. And, and there is one uh, other point that I think we don't discuss uh, often, uh, often enough, uh, which is uh, if the North Korean population knows how their situation compares to the Chinese population, the South Korean population, and, and I think we have enough data to support this point that North Koreans have access to outside information that they know how living conditions are better in China and far better in, 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 in South Korea through, through dramas they might get, uh, uh, for example, uh, in, into the country. There is always the lingering potential that at some point North Koreans uh, say, well, we are fed up. We want a change in leadership. Uh, I'm not predicting that there is going to be an uprising against the Kim regime because we have been predicting this since the 1990s. It hasn't happened. I don't think we have any data point to, to suggest that this might happen. But, but who knows, right? This has happened in Central Eastern Europe in the past. This has happened in, in North Africa uh, as well in places where many people predicted that the regime would stay in power for a very long period of time, right? So, so who knows if in North Korea this might happen eventually. And I think with an arms control deal, a better economic situation in North Korea, the possibilities of the North Korean regime being overthrown by its own population uh, would be reduced. I'm not saying whether this is good or bad, but I'm just saying the possibilities of, the, of having a regime change in North Korea would reduce uh, through an arms control deal. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so Jean, we're gonna wrap up the questions with you. Um, how would or how do you think the Biden administration would react to an arms control agreement with the North Koreans? Are they considering, do you see that as part of their strategy? And we haven't really addressed China and what China's thinking uh, is at this moment on North Korea. So maybe you could talk a little bit about, about China as well. We have about, uh, about 10 more, less than 10 minutes. Um, for, for our program. So I would say discussion of, of China's role in all of this might merit another panel discussion because <laughs> that's a very complicated issue that has to do with, we'd have to address China's South Korea, the um, growing strategic competition between the US and China that we've seen under the Trump administration and continuing into this Biden administration. So. Um, but uh, to your question, I think the Biden administration is going to have to approach the language around the the the, the deal very carefully uh, because of because of the concerns I think that um, Dr. Narang raised uh, concerns about. Um, I mean, I li I always like his phrase risk reduction, and I I try to give him credit on that because he's the first person who who really has laid this out so clearly for me, but, um, but to pray it in that way, rather than trying to give um, the North Korean regime that de facto acceptance. So I think the language is going to have to be very, very careful. Um, it's very interesting to me. I think that in 2018, when we saw the phrase, the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula in the Singapore summit, I was wondering if that was a mistake. Uh, because we tend to we tend to call it the denuclearization of North Korea, um, not the Korean Peninsula, because of concerns that that would also mean the withdrawal of that nuclear umbrella that the U.S. maintains over South Korea. But I do think it's a very interesting. You know, we we journalists did go back and and question both the Trump administration and the Biden administration about that terminology, and they said no, this is this was right um, that. And I do agree that you have to always uh, look at those as the end result that you're aiming for. What happens on the on the road to that end point that you all agree on is going to be the tricky issue. Um, now, I don't know if I've answered your question, but I actually wanted to turn the platform back to you, Carol, and for you to share some of your insight, if you don't mind, because you have spent, you and I were both in North Korea as journalists in 2017, perhaps more recently than anyone else on this panel. Um, but mm -hmm. I'd be curious for you as somebody who now is in, in, enmeshed in this issue of arms control with your new position, mm -hmm. uh, building on what you've experienced in North Korea, if you could share, if you don't mind sharing your insight and your 
your thoughts on this issue? Sure. Um, I, uh, I was there in September of 2017, which was a moment of great uh, sturm und drang between the United States and North Korea. The rhetoric was extremely heated and the, uh, it was, you know, Trump was a reasonably new president at the time. And, uh, you know, it was really unclear how it would all evolve. And it was a, uh, I think, a particularly opportune moment for us to go there. I, I went with my colleague, Nick uh, Kristoff, and two of our videographers, and we were there for about five days. And the, uh, the North Koreans had decided um, that year, 2017, to do somewhat of a charm offensive with Western journalists. And so several organizations got a chance to go in and spend some time there. It was uh, usually they only bring Western journalists in, uh, I mean, apart from you who, who were there, you know, on a regular basis, but um, they had been had a practice of only bringing in Western journalists for big events. And so we, we would, we were actually, hanging around for a few days. Obviously the situation was very scripted. It was very alarming to sort of see how the North Korean people that we were able to speak with had internalized the sense, you, you were talking about a sense of fear and the fact that Americans uh, were the threat were the enemy. But I have to say, and I think this is the value of going even to places where you know there's an incredible indoctrination. You know, there were moments where you had a sense of humanity. Uh, a woman we were talking with, uh, you know, sort of gave us the party line. And then, you know, as we sort of probed a little deeper, she started to tear up about, you know, how she felt she was conflicted about how she felt about Americans. And, and we met other people who seemed to have that sense as well. We, we talked to a young boy and, um, who, and he seemed like traumatized to, to even try to talk to us. And he said, my heart is pounding. I've never spoken to an American before. So uh, it certainly was revelatory to us. Um, uh, you know, obviously, President Trump and, and leader Kim eventually, you know, went and had their diplomatic dance. But um, it, I thought it was a very, um, it was a very useful insight into the comp a more complex place than we would think from the outside. So anyway, I know we, we have to wrap it up and, um, but thank you. Did Jean, did you wanna say something else? I was going to say, it looks like we had one question. Is somebody able to read that question coming in? Hold on. And it looks see. like it's for Oscar from Oscar from the Polish Institute of International Affairs. Yeah. The question is, do you take into account that the Biden administration is only pretending to intend pursuing arms control in its policy towards the DPRK and in fact intends to maintain the current position uh, uh, in favor of complete denuclearization. So does somebody want to, uh, uh, I know I mean, that- I'll say that, very briefly, uh, Ramon, uh, I'll let you get in, Jean, Gina, Carol, if you have anything, but I'll just say, I, I disagree with the premise of the, the question. I, I don't think the Biden administration is pretending uh, right. to be interested in pursuing arms control and risk reduction. I think it's generally interested because that's really the only realistic pathway forward. And I will, I will say that, you know, the, the phrase complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula is from 19, as early as 1992. I have to go back and see if there are any earlier formulations of it. But we use that phrase because it's what the North Koreans have agreed to on paper. And there is obviously wide disagreement on both sides as to what complete denu denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula means. And that ambiguity has been virtuous so far because it allows both sides to paper over the fact that North Korea views it as breaking the alliance and the U.S. and South Korea view it as North Korea essentially giving up its nuclear weapons. That said, it is a phrase that works to get both sides to the table. And it is a journey and not a destination. Nobody has any illusions that, you know, you're going to see, ever see in our lifetimes, as long as the Kim family is in power. The footnote, you know, if there is domestic regime change, all bets are off the table. And that's out of my lane. But um, I... I 
you know, I think that there's, uh, there are some very scary possibilities depending on how that goes. Nevertheless, you know, denuclearization and complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula uh, is a very specific phrase chosen for a particular reason, but it is a journey and not a destination. Uh, and we can maintain it as a rhetorical endpoint, being fully aware that if we get even a quarter of the way down the, you know, the train track, it's still pretty good. So anyone else, feel free to jump in. Ramon, did you want to jump in on that? If yeah, not, get, 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 okay. Just to say that I, I don't I don't see how any U.S. government or South Korean government, for that matter, could give up on this as the ultimate goal, right? But but I do think that the Biden administration seems to be much more realistic, and the messaging has been there even before they were elected, because many of the uh, people serving in the Biden administration had written about North Korea before they were uh, before Biden was elected, and 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 they were making these points, right? That maybe we have to accept uh, the realistic option again, which is a, an arms control deal. So um, yeah, without abandoning the ultimate goal of denuclearization, I, I, I do think that is not rhetoric from the Biden administration. It seems to be a genuine wish to improve the the, the conditions, the situation for the U.S. itself, right, through an arms control deal. Um, I know Gina had a couple of comments as well, and, and she'll be the last because we're running out of time. Yeah, in my opinion, okay, constraining North Korea's nuclear uh, capability is good, but R&D on North Korea's nuclear program has never stopped. If sanctions are eased in return for arms control agreement, the supply and demand of uh, strategic goods will be back on track and North Korea will have more options to wage a war through uh, military modernization. A risk reduction is a good idea, but under what condition will North Korea use nuclear weapons? That's the question. North Korea understands that using a nuclear bomb is suicidal. Then when regime collapse is imminent, then it will consider using it. That means there should be a full preparation of an all-out war, which is a very, very extreme case, in my opinion. That's my uh, final thought. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to all the panelists. You've all been terrific. And uh, thanks as well to the sponsors, the Wilson Centers, the, the Brussels School of Governance, and the Jeju Peace Institute and the Jeju Forum. This really has been a wonderful exchange. And I know we could go on for a lot longer, but, um, but everything comes to an end. So thank you very much to all. Thank you. 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 Thank